In August of 2000, one of the world's great submarines glided through the frigid depths of an Arctic sea. She was there to practice the skills of a Cold War many thought was over. But the demands of that war had planted the seeds of disaster in this great ship, and 118 men would pay with their lives. Inviting disaster, Kursk, next on Modern Marvels. Saturday, August 12, 2000, 11.20 a.m. The southern Barents Sea, north of Murmansk, Russia. Even in summer, snow can fall on these waters that border the Kola Peninsula. But they are the only permanently ice-free access that Russia's northern fleet has to the world. And it is at this time of year that Russia conducts war games for the ships of this fleet. Today, the Russian cruiser Peter the Great leads other vessels of the fleet in a game of cat and mouse. Their opponent is not an American, but a Russian submarine, designated K-141. Her name is Kursk. The captain of the Kursk and his crew make preparations for a mock attack. It is an attack that will never happen. At 11.28, an explosion equivalent to 200 pounds of TNT rocks the Kursk. Sixty-five miles away from Kursk, the American submarine Memphis lies eavesdropping on the Russian exercise. Only minutes after the first explosion, a second massive blast over 40 times greater than the first registers on the American sonar. We will never know for certain the cause of the explosions. What is known is that the enormous force of the second blast sends the Kursk and her crew to the bottom of the Barents Sea. This newest sub is named for the largest tank battle of World War II. The enormous new boat is christened Kursk. The Kursk was 505 feet long, 60 feet across at the beam, and displaced 18,000 tons submerged. It was impressive, no question about it. You know, we often look at, at the Russian uh, Navy, the Russian armed forces, and believe it's a generation behind what the United States uh, fields. But in fact, the Kursk was an exceptional piece of engineering. As Captain Lyachin slowed to eight knots, he prepared to launch a practice version of the 6576 torpedo that Russian sailors nicknamed Fatty, or the Fat Girl. The Fat Girl torpedo weighs 9,000 pounds and is propelled by kerosene fuel. But to move this enormous weapon at high speeds, the energy supplied to the motor by the kerosene must receive an immense boost by being force-fed huge amounts of oxygen. The oxygen is supplied by a simple but highly concentrated chemical called hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is a manufactured chemical they start with water and then they put an extra oxygen atom on each water molecule. But if the hydrogen peroxide comes in contact with certain catalytics materials, such as copper or brass or other contaminants, then the hydrogen peroxide begins to disassociate rapidly. It produces great heat. The heat in turn generates great pressure by expanding the volume of peroxide by 5,000 times. But the Russians were willing to gamble on using this temperamental but powerful chemical. Both the British and American navies introduced peroxide torpedoes at the end of World War II. But by the 1960s, both navies abandoned peroxide as too dangerous. Peroxide-powered torpedoes required ongoing and highly skilled maintenance. Such maintenance can be demanding in the most well-funded navies. In the Russian Navy of 2000, peroxide torpedoes were accidents waiting to happen. Later review of records indicated the peroxide-fueled weapon that went into the Kursk's torpedo tube had not received the maintenance it required. It became clear that those torpedoes had been stored and forgotten. They had been neglected. And this is not a can of tomato soup that can be stored on a shelf for years. Sometime that morning of August 12th, 
the high test peroxide probably managed to leak through a gasket or corroded seal. Once the leaking peroxide contacted brass or copper, pressure began to build with irresistible force until at last the torpedo exploded like a balloon backward into the torpedo room. The massive fireball raced through the first compartments, killing all in its path, probably including Captain Liachin. Within seconds, temperatures in the torpedo room soared to 5,000 degrees until at least four torpedo warheads exploded. With the force of five tons of TNT, the blast obliterated the front of the Kursk. Slowly, the great ship headed down by the bow until she settled onto the bottom, 350 feet below the surface. The shockwave had moved back through the sub, battering down bulkheads and instantly killing all it hit. No one on the surface is taking any action to come to their aid. On board his flagship, Peter the Great, the commander of the Northern Fleet, Admiral Vyacheslav Popov, is aware Kursk is overdue to check in. Now he's told two explosions have been picked up by sonar. As an ex-submariner, Popov knows something terrible has happened to Kursk. He also knows that as the fleet commander, he would take a great deal of the blame. In the tradition of the Russian military, his immediate reaction on this day is to do nothing. After a few minutes, dive supervisors above pass the word. It is time to send a signal to anyone who might still be alive inside the Kursk. Scott will tap a prearranged code on the side of the hull. I mean, we, we did want it to be, you know, if you could will something to happen, that's what you wanted to happen. You wanted to hear something. Tony rests his head on the hull and stops breathing to listen for the slightest response. Sadly, there is no answer. The hatch leads to an intermediate chamber, which is separated from the ninth compartment by a second lower hatch that opens inward. If the divers open the outer hatch and the inner hatch is already open, survivors below will drown. It is vital the rescuers learn if the interconnecting chamber is flooded. They come up with a plan to do this by opening a small valve on the outer hatch. The time has arrived to fully open the inner hatch. An arm of the remote vehicle pushes it open. The remaining gas that had accumulated in the ninth compartment rushes out. Later tests will confirm this gas was unfit for human life. Two Dutch companies are contracted to take on the immense job of retrieving the great sub. Work begins 11 months after the accident. The forward section of Kursk, which had sustained massive damage from the explosions, will be cut off and left behind. Giant is equipped with 26 heavy cables, each capable of lifting 900 tons. Divers begin cutting holes into the side of Kursk with powerful jets of abrasive sand. After weeks of work, each of the cables on the barge is attached to the holes. On October 8, 2001, 14 months after the accident, mammoth jacks on board the giant at last begin to lift the Kursk and the remains of the sailors who rest within her. Even without her bow, Kursk weighs 9,600 tons. Never before has anything this heavy been lifted from the bottom of the sea. It takes 15 hours to raise the Hulk into position below the giant. On October 23, 2001, water is drained and the face of the great submarine once again appears. In the weeks that follow, bodies are removed and investigators pour over every part of the sub. Just three of the 118 crewmen are left unidentified. Autopsies of the dead sailors reveal the 23 survivors in the ninth compartment at last met their end in a second disaster. The final event that killed those sailors was a fire, an intense fire, caused by their chemical canisters that generated oxygen meeting 
an oily film on the water that was rising in that compartment.